so wonderful to hear such great discussion going, and I hate to be the one that has to cut it short. Uh, but I will do so only in order to move on to our next round of research presentations. So these rounds of research presentations will allow us to highlight for you some of the most recently funded projects across the three campuses and, importantly, across our four priority areas, stewarding land and water resources, growing farm business and communities, ensuring animal health and welfare, and enriching human health and nutrition. My name is Heather White, and I'm the faculty director for the Dairy Innovation Hub. And I have to tell you that supporting and funding the projects across these priority areas and campuses has been one of the most fulfilling parts of my role as faculty director. So within two different blocks of research talks, we're going to highlight some of these for you. You'll see that they're presented either by the lead researcher or in some cases by a pair of collaborators. They'll each speak for 10 minutes on their project and we'll hold questions to the end of that block. Our first sets of presentations will be research that have been funded in the growing farm business and communities and stewarding land and water resource priority areas. One thing you'll note, whether it's the poster research projects or any of the ones you hear here, is that several of the projects span different priority areas. As is naturally occurring on farm and in research, most of what we do actually addresses several concerns or questions. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce our first speakers. Chuck Nicholson is an Associate Professor of Agricultural and Applied Economics at UW-Madison, whose position is funded by the Dairy Innovation Hub. Chuck is joined by Kevin Bernhardt, a professor of agribusiness here at UW Platteville and UW Extension Farm Management Specialist. Chuck and Kevin are going to talk about their work on a special project related to the cost of dairy production in Wisconsin. Please welcome these presenters. Okay, good morning. Thank you for being here. It's a great pleasure to be here with uh, Kevin. And I think this project illustrates some of the best things about what the Hub has allowed us to do, in part because the idea for the project was initiated by conversations with a Wisconsin dairy farmer. Uh, it involves the collaboration of all three of the UW campuses associated with the Hub. Uh, and it addresses a fairly practical problem that should be of interest. So we started out uh, with this question about the patterns of cost of production and what determines it. And one of the things that struck us was looking across some years of data here, we have an extremely wide range of costs of production. And that in and of itself should be a little bit curious because what is driving a difference uh, that almost gets up to about $20 per hundredweight from one farm to another in the same year, and we see that pattern consistently across the five years we're looking at. So this very large range was something that got us uh, a bit interested about why is that and what might we do to make that range a bit less narrow. So we started out with some listening sessions uh, with farm groups to get input on a project. Our goals are to evaluate some different sources of information on cost of production that we'll talk more about in a moment, document those specifically within the state of Wisconsin and think about things by size and production system, think about the importance of cost of production to both the pricing and profitability of dairy farms, and we also have the goal of raising awareness of the need to continue to collect the kind of data that allowed us to do this analysis through uh, an, an initiative called FarmBench. Okay? And we have some concluding uh, educational webinars and podcasts, including one tomorrow on Dairy Signal that we'll both be uh, sharing additional information on. So we have some important questions we want to try and understand, the role of pricing and profitability, or production and profitability, what causes those large differences that we showed you just a minute ago. And an interesting question, particularly for me, I'll talk about later, is it always the same farms that are in the lower part of that spectrum of costs and in the higher part of that spectrum of costs, are they different? What's the relative importance of cost of production in uh, profitability metrics? And can we identify management strategies that will lower that cost of production? Okay. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the guy who really knows. Kevin is going to tell you more about his part of this. Okay. Thank you, Chuck. Well, uh, first of all, putting two professors behind a microphone with an audience and telling them that they can speak for five minutes each is really difficult. <laughs> but I'll give it a try. 
First of all, let me uh, just mention the data that we were working with is 174 farms, Wisconsin farms. In the years 2014 to 2018, five years there, uh, now, if you recall back to that time, profitability was great for one of those years, 2014, and lousy for the next four. So that reflects itself in the data as well. Uh, the other thing to remember is profits are not made by cost of production. Profits are made by the difference between revenue and cost of production. And that's going to come out loud and clear here as well. We did several studies. Uh, uh, still doing them. Some of those are cost of production by cow, cost of production by hundredweight, grouping all the farms on a five-year average by cost of production, and then looking at profit itself based on return on assets and doing the same thing. So grouping farms by return on assets based on a five-year average. Chuck will be doing it more on individual years. Uh, and a few other types of sorts, sorting by herd size, and a few other metrics that I'll mention at the very end here. Uh, so getting to the PowerPoint, this is just a glimpse of a few of the things. Uh, this is based on median, especially for price. Um, looking at average, it can get quite distorted when you look at different types of farms, but the median may be a little bit more reflective. This is by herd size. All these slides here happen to be by herd size. The green line is the uh, average of the top third of farms by profitability uh, with respect to, um, uh, this is what their price is. So that top third of farms had a 1735 price, for example, for the one to 99 herd size. And that's about a, let's see, let me advance this up. That's about a 21 cent difference. The other herd size is there, 11 cents, 73 cents. And actually for the largest farms, it flipped the other way just a bit when you look at it by the median. So price is part of profitability. Uh, production is a part of profitability. So here's the differences there. This is pounds per cow per year. So put the decimal point over two spots for 100 weight. Uh, so 1,700 weights, 11, 28, 25 per cow difference in production as you look at the difference between the top third most profitable and the lowest third most profitable for each of those herd size groups. This is where it gets kind of interesting. Look at the left side first. Try to ignore that right side if you can. And initially looking at cost of production per cow. And I first looked at that and I'm going, wait a minute, what's going on here? Uh, that cost of production is increasing with herd size, first of all. And if I look at just profit groups only, not herd size, I don't have that graph here, but if I was looking at only profit groups, lowest third, middle third, and highest profit group, the cost per cow increases. And I'm going, wait a minute, how can that be? And then uh, dummy me here realized that cost of production per hundredweight includes production. So you saw what the production was. That's going up. Cost of production per cow, so now look at the right side and you see what, what happens when you put the two together. So there's a lot of interactions here. You know, there's always that good battle between the economics department and the dairy and animal science department. What's more important, increasing production or lowering costs? And I think the answer is both, right? We, we have to be a part of that, or what is the relative difference between the two? Some uh, last slide I have here is just kind of getting a feeling for what is the source of profitability coming from. Is it coming from price? Is it coming from cost of production per cow being lower? Is it coming from production being higher? In terms of herd size, those lowest groups, they're doing it through cost of production being lower. In terms of the higher herd size groups, they're doing it for production being higher. Uh, and finally, just to kind of wrap up my part of it here a little bit, uh, there is, a f I think you do have one more here, don't I? Yeah, there it is. Um, looking at profit groups by themselves, not herd size now, just profit groups, lowest third, middle third, high third. The thing that we're seeing very prevalent is that to get from the low third profit group to the middle, you have to cut costs. So you're cutting costs per cow, you have a lot of inefficiencies out there, and you're managing yourself to greater efficiency in that input use. 
But if you want to get to the high third group, if you want to be that top performing dairy operation, like some of those we saw just this morning, there's a little bit different tact. Spend money to make money. So that group is spending money in order to be able to get relatively higher production and in the end, higher profits. Up to you. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Kevin. I think one of the important lessons that we've learned, at least I've learned through this, is that it's good to focus on that idea of cost of production, but as Kevin said, the spending money to make money is an important component of this as well, particularly for some of those farm groups that you just mentioned. So I want to do fairly briefly, one of the things we've also been doing, looking through the data, is to try and understand basic patterns that we see with regard to the cost of production side of the equation. I'm not going to belabor these right now, but basically what we're seeing is uh, larger herd sizes, uh, more milk, uh, have generally the impact of lowering the average cost of production, in this case per hundredweight. Uh, having more farm assets, and then also the milk price, uh, surprisingly enough, maybe to many, are associated with higher costs of production. And that milk price idea perhaps, again, relates to the spend money to make money. You've got a good price here, you can afford to feed the cows a bit more, and so you might see higher cost of production, but they may be a wise strategy. Okay? So I also mentioned earlier on one of the questions about are the farms that are in the lowest cost of production categories and the highest cost of production categories always the same? That is, if you look at this graph, are they always sort of swimming within their same lane up at the top or up at the bottom? And so that's one possibility that we looked at. And another is that there's a great deal of variation over time. The farms tend to bounce around. They have a good year one year. They have a not so good year the next year in terms of cost of production. And actually what we found was that there's a great deal of variability. It's really hard or it seems really hard to be either in the lowest cost of production category consistently or for that matter in the highest cost of production category consistently. And this graph actually shows the trajectories for three farms that fall into those different categories. I noticed here that my green always highest should be modified when we post these to be always lowest. But you can see there are farms that consistently achieve that. Uh, there are farms that consistently have uh, that higher average cost of production. Uh, and then there are those that vary quite a lot. And these are just examples uh, of how these patterns look. So one of the things that we will do going forward is try and better understand why do we see those different patterns and why is it so hard to be consistently in one of those categories. One of the things that we do see associated with greater variability in cost tends to be farm size. Uh, partly that's a function of the data that we have available to us. Uh, but there seems to be a relationship between having uh, a larger herd size and having less variability over time in those uh, cost of production values. Okay. So I have like about a minute. Uh, we had listening to sessions uh, last year. We've been doing data analysis on some different types of information that we'll share in a complete report by the end of the year. Uh, we're actually working on accessing data for 2019 to 2021 because we know 2018 is now kind of ancient history. It's even pre-pandemic. Uh, it's one of our main goals is to demonstrate the usefulness of this information. We've got uh, a webinar that we did back in May and another that we have uh, tomorrow. So our ultimate goal is to try and contribute to decision making on farms and also to continue to have access to relevant data that helps us evaluate uh, farm performance. So. I'll hand it back over to Kevin in case he has anything else you'd like to add to that. Nope. I see we're getting the, the big red sign there, so I believe okay. we're done. <laughs> All right. Let's thank, oh, sorry. Let's thank Chuck and Kevin. All right. So with that, I'd love to introduce our next speakers, uh, John Obladon. Close. I practiced. Uh, and Joseph Wu. John is a professor of mechanical and industrial engineering here at UW-Platteville, and Joseph is a professor of chemistry also here at UW-Platteville. Please welcome John and Joseph. Okay. Thank you. The topic of our presentation is uh, mechanical properties of polyamide matrix dairy protein composites that were fabricated using selective laser sintering. The purpose of the research is to transform dairy wastes, particularly 
casein and whey into engineering components using some sets of additive manufacturing processes. And the process we, we are presenting on today is called selective laser sintering. It converts powdered materials into solid objects. Uh, this is the agenda, the motivation, the materials we used, and the processes, the print qualities will be assessed in terms of a lot of data that have been generated, and uh, we will evaluate the mechanical properties and compare. Well, the motivation arises from the fact that we hear about waste in the daily business. Uh, we hear of way waste in the, process, in, in the cost of processing dairy products. And we also know about ca of, of uh, casein. And those materials historically have been proven to have some poly polymeric properties. And they have also been used for some items in the past. And we also know that there are pressures in terms of competition uh, with dairy milk in the market. There are a lot of crop-based milks, milk products that are becoming very popular and increasingly they'll be popular and they'll be cutting into the market of dairy uh, mix uh, with time going forward. And we also want to promote circular economy in terms of looking into biological materials that can be used for engineering applications, which are becoming in, in, uh, 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 popular now and with increasing demand based on the, on the uh, realities of climate change. So uh, we all know that uh, we, uh, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say we all know, but it is common knowledge that uh, milk contains several components, one of which is protein. And the protein is uh, about 3.3 .3 or thereabouts in percentages. And uh, we also, as I've mentioned previously, uh, identified uses for casein and and, and we, we are doing a kind of a parallel study at this, at this time. The button shown there is, was made by casein in the past, and we, we are curious to see what can we do with casein using the processes that we are working on currently. So previously it had been used for additives, for adhesives, for buttons, for paints, and some other polymeric materials. So, to start with, we are not converting casein directly to final product, but we are taking it step by step. We have proven materials that are, that are used for fabricating uh, products, engineering products in the market that are commercially available. So what we do for, at the initial time is to blend casein and whey with those materials to evaluate how much the properties change. So uh, the, pre the preliminary data we have that is being presented here are based on those combination of materials. So we have the PA12. PA12 is polyamide 12. We're also working on polyamide 11 that are commercially available and being used in the market with proven uh, strength properties. Then we have on the, two, on the other side, uh, casing uh, broken down into finer, fine particles Although with the preliminary work presented here, we couldn't get to as fine particles as much as we wanted, but just recently we were able to find ways to get it very fine, very close to what we want it to be to improve the properties that we are aiming at. Then for engineering analysis or for engineering applications, uh, if you want to use a material for, for fabrication, we have standard ways for evaluating the mechanical properties, which include tension testing, include flexural uh, testing, and also impact uh, analysis. Well, for tension testing, I have a cane here, uh, just to illustrate, if you want to test how much you pull a material until it breaks, what stress level is able to break it. Then if you talk about flexure, imagine having a beam like this and you apply load, how much of load of how much of stress do you apply to bend it and to eventually break it? And also for impact, how much of sudden impact do you apply on the material before it breaks? So that's, those are standard mechanical engineering tests that we designed and subjected our 
samples to. So for tensile testing, we have clearly improved strengths for our fabricated uh, samples uh, that are based on composites of casein addition to the commercially available material. And all the, all the percentages of compositions of the materials uh, demonstrated significant improved strength. And we, in, the, in the course of evaluation, we discovered that our material was becoming more brittle with the addition of casein. So we thought of other things that we could add that could uh, reduce the, the brittleness. So that was when we got some improved data in the process and uh, significantly higher strengths and ductility of the materials were improved. Then we also have stiffness. Stiffness is resistance to deformation. Uh, if you pull a material, does it stay the same or does it improve easily? Does it deform easily or does it deform gradually based uh, at increasing stress? That is what this one is based on. And we discover that we have uh, improved stiffness, stiffness over the commercially available material. The commercially available material is in blue color on the left-hand side. So clearly our material is a lot better than what is in the, in the market. So this one is showing the effect of uh, particle size that I showed you at the beginning and how much the strength improved, even with the addition of uh, plasticizer. And there are work that are still going on. As I mentioned, this is a preliminary data, and we have some more recent data that are not presented here that are showing some uh, clear improvement. Well, when, we, uh, when you have improved strengths in engineering, uh, most often it's at the expense of what we call uh, percentage allocation or ductility of the material. Uh, when you have sudden increasing strength, you need to work on improving how much the material is able to deform before it, is, it breaks. So this is an ongoing work to improve the ductility of the material. We are getting, it, we are getting close to where we expect to get to in the uh, preliminary work. Then these are data for flexural stress, uh, how much load the material can sustain before it breaks under lateral loading. Uh, our, our materials demonstrates or demonstrated uh, significant improvement over commercially available materials. Then for impact, we have scattered data that we are still observing and working on to ensure that we improve upon. Then uh, for characterization analysis, it's usually good to look at what is inside the material, what is causing failure, uh, where does the failure originate from and propagate from. So we look at the microstructure of the samples that we fabricated, and we were able to see that there were some agglomerations that occurred in the process of pr processing the material. And uh, with the recent improvement or uh, advance that we were able to record in getting proper sizing of our material, we hope that that will be uh, resolved. So in conclusion, we can say that Kesin is showing us very promising uh, uh, results in terms of its uh, usefulness for engineering applications. Uh, and uh, this one is demonstrated based on the uh, mechanical properties that we can see. And ultimately, our plan is to use casein exclusively without the commercially available material that are currently used in this study. Thank you. And we want to thank the Dairy Innovation Hub for enabling these studies. Great. Thank you, John and Joseph. And now we're going to continue moving into stewarding land and water resources projects. Marta Coleman, Coleman is an assistant professor in the newly merged Department of Plant and Agroecosystems Sciences at UW-Madison. She's also an extension specialist in the Division of Extension in Forge Systems Agroecology. Please welcome Marta. Hi, good morning. So yes, my name is Marta Coleman. Uh, I just started as an assistant professor, as Heather mentioned, 
Uh, I started in January of this year, so I was very excited to get invited to be here because this is the fourth summit, but it's my very first one. So I appreciate the opportunity to share this with you. Um, another point that I wanted to make is that I'm very appreciative of the support of the Dairy Innovation Hub. This was actually the first grant that I applied to as an assistant professor, and I got it. So very, I feel very lucky, very fortunate to, to be here. Um, it was also very... Um, significant to me to look through all the document documentation that gave birth kind of to the Dairy Innovation Hub and all the very well documented list of priorities for me to come into a new position and be able to understand what are the needs immediate and long term was, was very interesting. So um, I'm going to be talking about manure application recommendations for alfalfa interceded into corn silage. So what, what do we know about corn silage here in Wisconsin is that it's a very important part of the dairy industry. It occupies a very large acreage here in Wisconsin. Um, oftentimes, it is also planted after alfalfa termination. So uh, oftentimes, what producers take advantage of is that you get some of those nutrient credits, especially in terms of nitrogen, from terminating a legume and planting a grass afterwards. Now, very often, there is manure application involved in corn silage production, right? Um, and there are several studies that show that soil cover significantly reduces the risk to water quality as it is associated with manure application. What do I mean by that? Very often, what we have is when we have corn silage production, during the growing season, we have the corn covering that soil. We harvest Oftentimes, after harvest, that soil becomes exposed, and if there is um, events of large precipitation or rainfall, there is the risk, the potential, that there are going to be losses of, of nitrogen and, and phosphorus uh, to water bodies. So uh, one of the ways that we know to reduce that is to maintain that soil covered, especially with living crops, with living plants. Now, how about alfalfa? We know it's a great forage for lactating cows. Um, we are always thinking, so as a forage scientist, I'm always thinking about forage production, uh, how much and what quality is that forage needs to achieve so that the, the animals that are consuming it can really express all that genetic potential. Uh, but there is also a lot of uh, ecosystem services, which are kind of the added values that are provided by those forages. So when I think about legumes, especially when I think about alfalfa, uh, there are some advantages to soil health, soil cover. There is a very extensive root system, so there is a great use of water and nutrients, which was very apparent in this past year, particularly with the drought. Uh, there is potential to adding a legume in a rotation to reduce some of the diseases present, present in grasses. But there's also challenges to producing that alfalfa. So typically, in that first year, the production is about 50% of what is expected for a fully established stand. But there is also quite a bit of, of cost to establish that first year, which means that during that first year, you have both the greatest cost associated with alfalfa production and also the lowest production. So how can we intermediate both of those challenges associated with corn silage production and alfalfa production into a new system? So there is this new alfalfa interceded into corn silage system. I put it here, a novel system, but in reality there has been a lot of research, more than 10 years of research, on how to make this system work. So in uh, summary, the typical system will have corn, that corn is harvested, we have the exposed soil, we can potentially add some manure, um, and we plant alfalfa afterwards. So that's the very typical production system. On the intercity system, we actually plant both of them together, the corn and the alfalfa, so that after we harvest that corn, the alfalfa remains underneath, kind of as a cover crop. It works as a cover crop to the corn, and the corn also serves as, as a companion crop to the alfalfa. So that during that first year, you harvest the corn, and on the second year, when you start, you basically start with a fully established alfalfa system, meaning that you skip that first low production system, basically. 
there are a couple of details about this to make it work, which is a result, again, of a lot of research. Um, there is a time for alfalfa planting, but also we need to reduce the corn uh, seeding rates a little bit to make sure that we're going to have some light coming through the canopy that will allow that alfalfa to grow. So what are some of the positives of this system? Again, we skipped that first year of low production. We are going to maintain soil cover with living plants, which is very beneficial, very protective to water quality and soil. Um, and over four years, we have done, done some studies that show that it's more profitable compared to other typical rotations over those four years. However, there are some challenges associated with it as well. So typically, in terms of uh, the corn silage production, there is a little bit of, of a drag, typically 10%. In dry years, like this past year, that was greater because of the competition with, uh, between alfalfa and corn. Um, and there is also a bit of an increase in alfalfa disease pressure because under that corn uh, canopy is, uh, that holds a lot of moisture it just really helps a lot of diseases to develop. And also, how about the manure? We still have manure that we need to apply to these fields. Can we apply it to this, this living crop or not? So these are the results uh, from an Arlington demonstration plot that is comparing the typical and the alfalfa interseeded system. What I wanted to get your attention is that there are 2022, 2023, uh, on top is management practices, on the bottom is production. Uh, so this was evaluated with the typical, which is corn silage, followed by spring seeded alfalfa. And then the interseeded system with disease and growth regulator, that is applied to the alfalfa to reduce competition a little bit, and also just with fungicide and insecticide. So what I want to get your attention is that in 2022, the amount of passes in, in terms of management is greater in the interseeded system because you are, in fact, managing two crops. But when we look at production over the two years, in terms of dry matter, there is an increase in the interseeded system compared to the traditional. And that is mostly because of the increase in alfalfa. So what about the manure management? What am I looking at now? So uh, we are currently um, running a study on small plots at two locations. And what we are looking, you can see here some of the, the corn that was already harvested. The rest is the alfalfa established. And we're going to evaluate what happens to that alfalfa and to soil responses in terms of when there is no manure applied, when manure is only applied in the fall, when manure is only applied in the spring, and both of them. And again, we're going to do some soil samples characterizations, already collected the samples. We're going to follow that alfalfa forage production and nutritive value in the year of alfalfa production, on the, so in the second year. I'm also looking at some soil respiration, uh, and hopefully we'll, what we'll get out of this is the instructions for manure application in interseeded systems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marta. All right, this will be our last presentation in this block, and then we'll take a, a second to grab some questions. So Suzanne Wisner is an assistant professor of plant and earth science and hub-funded faculty member at UW River Falls. She's joined today by her student, Jade Waddock, to introduce their project about creating a greenhouse gas budget for the Man Valley Farm. So thanks to the speakers. Yeah, thank you for having us here. So um, I don't have to go through this title. This is a project that was funded through the Dairy Innovation Hub um, uh, that also funded Jade this summer or this past summer. Um, I want to start with acknowledging my funding sources. I'm really grateful for the Dairy Innovation Hub. Um, some of you might know I used to be a postdoc at UW-Madison, so I'm really grateful to uh, be continuing this research. And of course, that the Dairy Innovation Hub is funding awesome students like Jade from uh, UW-Madison. And then you can see there's a couple of other funding sources because the research that the Dairy Innovation Hub funds also leads to other uh, funding um, as well. And then the collaborators, uh, Paul Stoy, Michelle Watteau, as well as Lakshmi uh, Prasad at UW-Madison. And then our new farm manager, Dwayne Thompson at Man Valley Farm. I'm super grateful for um, his support during the summer. And I always like to include our um, dairy cows as well, um, the ladies. And down below that picture is actually 
Um, that's our beef herd at the Man Valley Farm, and I included that because that was a funny coincidence when Jade and I were working there this summer. We turned around for literally 10 seconds, and they were all walking around, and suddenly they were staring at us like this, and I always wish this, is, this would be my students in my classes, which, <laughs> you know, how it goes. Um, this is why we're here. Um, animal products, which includes dairy, um, is or has and is projected to have the highest ecological or environmental footprint. So in the top um, uh, there, you can see the greenhouse gas emissions are already the highest of all other agricultural products, but they're also projected to increase. And then you can see animal products also contribute to um, water quality issues, right? We're all aware of that. What I want to remind you of, though, is not that long ago, we had millions of bison walking around the, um, the Americas, right? And guess what they were emitting? A bunch of greenhouse gases as well. So it's not just about reducing greenhouse gases, it's about mitigating these greenhouse gases with, um, with a healthy soil and healthy vegetation. And this is our project. Um, it's looking uh, at improving the environmental and economic sustainability. You can see there's three, um, three parts to it. Basically, the first step that we started this summer is quantifying a greenhouse gas budget for the Man Valley Farm. So basically, a baseline budget from which we then can uh, maybe uh, come up with improvements, as well as a climate resilience target, uh, not just for Man Valley Farm, but also using that for other farms as well. And then to me, small dairy farms um, are close to my heart. I really want to improve the economic stability so that we don't continue to lose them um, every year. On the right side here, these are all the measurements we're taking, and you can see they're all across temporal and spatial scales. So we take annual measurements of soil and uh, forage quality, um, as well as with uh, an eddy covariance tower, we can take um, really high frequency measurements of CO2 exchange, so these are the greenhouse gases. Uh, using drone and satellite techniques, we can actually upscale that so, so that we're not just looking at Man Valley Farm, but we can use that information for other farms as well. And then in the center there, this is what we're focusing on today a little bit. This measures soil respiration. So um, soil respiration, uh, keep in mind, is made up of microbial and plant respiration, so the CO2 that is coming out of the soil. And then I'll take it. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, just our research in general. So this uh, on your left here is Man Valley Farm. So it has around 425 acres. There's around 100 head of cows. Um, pretty big place. So that star there uh, that's circled by blue is the Eddie Covariance Tower. Um, so as Susie said, it's kind of like a mini weather tower. It gives us high frequency readings of all the different things that we want to take data on. Um, these little red dots, they may be a bit hard to see, but on the northern uh, most edge of the map, there's a bunch of red dots, and then on the right-hand side of the map, there's a bunch more dots. Those are all where we put our soil colors, and that's where we find um, our soil data. And then that red little rectangle um, on that map is the dairy barns. That's where the cows typically stay. That's where we take some of our measurements from the cows. Um, so one thing to remember is that cows emit methane, um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out what we can do to help balance and improve sustainability of the farm. So here we have um, our soil and vegetation. So soil respiration is a multifaceted um, component. So there's microbial um, and, uh, sorry, um, so there's microbial and plants, right? So um, soil respiration is very important. And one thing to note is that um, healthy soil respirates a lot. So as you can see from our, some, from our preliminary data here, um, alfalfa has significantly greater CO2 respiration compared to corn and pasture. Um, and another thing to note is that our corn and alfalfa pastures were both irrigated. So there's not really a difference there. Um, and as you can see, we have this giant jump in uh, CO2 respiration between our uh, two of our cornfields and two of our pastures. And so um, soils with greater slopes have less CO2 uh, respiration. Um, there's reasons for that. Um, and if you have questions about the soil types at the top of this, you can come see me after and I'll be happy to answer those. Um, so we use the drone to take a lot of our data. 
And so one of the things that we measured at some of the other farms that we go to is NDRE, or the Normalized Difference Red Edge Index. So that measures the greenness of the plant or the health of the plant. And so um, the, the y-axis on these graphs is the greenness of the plants. And then our x-axis is the nitrogen application rate. Um, so uh, this is in uh, pounds, I believe, per acre. And so what you can see here from this graph is um, the more nitrogen application we put on, generally the higher the greenness. Um, but you can also see that plants at lower elevation um, are greener. Um, so that leads me into another thing that our drone was awesome enough to get for us, which was the difference in elevation. And so what we did was we took um, basically the lowest elevation and the highest elevation, we found the difference. It gives us about six meters of difference. And so what we were finding is that our difference in elevation can also give um, a difference in height. So what we're finding is that the lower the elevation, the taller the corn plants. And I'm talking like 10 feet tall. Those things were huge going through those fields. And what we're finding is that generally there's less greenness of the plants on the slopes, um, which means there's less nitrogen in the plants, and they're also a lot shorter than everywhere else. So this kind of raises the question of, if the, health, if the plant isn't as healthy on the slopes and it's not growing as tall, it's not producing as much, should we be farming, or I suppose growing crops on those hills? <laughs> All right, so going back to agricultural sustainability, which is what this project is about, right? So in this graph here, and I apologize, the um, citation will pop up in a second. I'm not as great with animations, apparently. But um, this one is looking at agricultural sustainability in terms of thermodynamics. And I like to remind my students, and I like to remind you, we are on a rotating planet in a near vacuum circling around the sun. That means we are subject to the laws of thermodynamics. And I would like you to keep that in mind. Because as this uh, study, which was published in, uh, I can't remember, I think 2015 now, um, can show you is in terms of thermodynamics, Growing crops at maximum yield might not be the best thing to do. So as you can see in this graph here, maximum efficiency is actually associated with, with a lower environmental footprint. So if we can shift our systems to, to something that can implement this philosophy, we can reach sustainability. And if you, uh, if you recall what, what it means to be a sustainable farm, this is from the USDA NEFA program. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these um, right now, but I want to, if you read these uh, different bullet points, really keep in mind or ask yourself that question of how many farms do you know that meet all of these points. Agricultural sustainability is not just a couple of them, it's all of them. So to me, it means a thermodynamic equilibrium. So not maximum yield, maximum efficiency, so that we can take care of our soils as well as um, yield. And then in this lower graph here, this is actually from a project that was funded by the Dairy Innovation Hub for my postdoc as well, from the U.S. Dairy Forage Research Center farm that indicated that just a small proportion of the farm, one-third in this case, can mitigate over 50% of the greenhouse gases emitted at that farm. So that's pretty great, right? It's just a small amount that we have to change. And something that I would like to finish with is we're talking about the environment and uh, improving the resilience and all that. But keep in mind that we also, in addition to diversifying our agroecosystems, we also have to think about our economies and industries because we are seeing more monopolies or monopolizing. Um, and if you think about just seed diversity, um, genetic diversity, all these things, they play a role and the industry plays a role. So we need to diversify our um, economies as well. And then lastly, um, thank you for having me, but I also, if you see that little QR code there, this is a grant that was funded, again, because of the Dairy Innovation Hub by the USDA uh, NLGCA, um, and it's actually a collaboration between UW Platteville and UW River Falls. So if you are a dairy farmer or know of any dairy farmers, come see me because this is a grant where we basically want to uh, build these, uh, these collaborations better. So thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you so much. All right, we have a few minutes for questions for any of the speakers in the first block. If you could make your way to the microphone just so that our online audience can hear the questions as well. Uh, and then we'll make sure the right speaker's available for you. For the interceding alfalfa um, presentation, wherever she Where's went. Marta? Um, yeah. Right behind you, go ahead. Just wondering if that was nerve wracking at all this spring when it decided not to rain until about the 4th of July. Uh, just wondering how that, uh, those two crops seeded together um, were looking uh, during that dry spell. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. And the answer is um, yes, absolutely. So the data that I showed for, it, for dry matter production was first year, which is corn and alfalfa at the same time, was 2022 in alfalfa 2023. Um, for the experimental plus that we started this year, some of them did okay. Some of them did very not okay. <laughs> um, so especially, we have one in Lancaster, Prairie de Sac, and Arlington. If I'm not wrong, at Lancaster, which was where the driest conditions uh, were happening, uh, I think the eel drag to corn was around 40%, which, again, I think that that's expected in terms of how competitive <coughs> it, the alfalfa is as it's growing with corn, and it was just a very, very difficult year. Um, so that 10% drag, that, that's a, a pretty good average over several years um, of the experiments, but definitely in the years where the expectation is that the, the drought is going to be intense, then I would be very, very cautious to suggest this system because of the, the challenge with, with the water. Thank you. Other questions for any of the presenters? Yeah, Ken Weigel from UW Madison. I have a question for Chuck and Kevin, which is where um, unpaid family labor and depreciation of assets, if I'm the last generation in the farm and not going to build new facilities, where that comes into play in your analysis, especially with the smaller farms. Okay, I'm going to walk and talk. Uh, so I'm going to be over here next to Kevin, so he's probably going to add something to that. So there are obviously different ways that you can measure cost of production. I was looking at things that we call operating costs, which don't include those very important things that you just asked about, Kent. Uh, other measures of cost of production do include that. A lot of the stuff that we've done does both to have a comparison. Uh, when Kevin talks about profitability measures, typically they also include elements of those very important things. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, whenever you read an article and they say the word cost of production, you immediately run for the hills because you don't know what kind of cost of production they're talking about. Uh, so it really needs to be defined. For my part of it, um, I looked at a total cost of production. So all operating costs, depreciation costs, unpaid labor and management, interest costs, uh, a total a total cost in that in that way does that answer your question yeah all right great any other questions have time for maybe one more I can't let the speakers off the hook too easy I'll also note that we intentionally have a long lunch so that you can network ask questions our goal would be to prevent the speakers from eating their food until the last five minutes. Uh, same with poster presenters, so put them to work. All right, if there aren't any other questions, we'll roll right into the next block of presentations. This block will focus on the animal health and welfare and the human health and nutrition uh, priority areas. So again, we'll hold the questions till the end of the block and uh, we'll also have time over lunch for that as well. So I'm pleased to introduce the first speaker of this block, which is Zaifan Wan. Zaifan is an assistant professor in the School of Agriculture uh, here at UW Platteville, and her position is also funded by the Dairy Innovation Hub. Her research interests are in dairy processing, food safety, and sustainable manufacturing. I will put a plug as well. There's an opportunity for tours at the end of today, and Zaifan's lab is one of those uh, that are featured in the tours. And I got to see some of the equipment and projects going on in that last night after the reception, and you won't want to miss that, so hopefully you'll be able to, to attend those tours. So with that, I'll turn it over to Zaifan. Okay. 
Thank you, Heather, and thank you, everyone, for joining. And so this is the project I want to share with you today. And this is a kind of recently funded uh, project, which we use the non-thermal atmospheric cold plasma technology with the goal to enhance the safety and the growth of alfalfa. As you already know, alfalfa is a very important forage that provides nutrients to the animals. And I'll always start the question about what is plasma, so bring everyone to the same page about this technology. Um, people have different perspectives when they think about plasma, like blood plasma or plasma TV. Well, the plasma we are talking about uh, today is like more in the physics realm, like uh, the fourth state of matter. Um, we can turn any, if we add enough energy to any material, we can turn a material from solid to liquid, to gas, and then by adding enough energy, we can turn it to a like very ionized state of gas, which we refer to as plasma. And um, the plasma consists of a lot of excited molecules, ions, items, um, or molecules in ground or excited states, free radicals. So this uh, table shows here is an example of the molecules or gas species that might be present in the air phase, uh, air plasma. And all those reactive gas species shown here have demonstrated a great effect on the antimicrobial properties. And we can see plasma in the nature very often if we go like different places, like lightning strike is an example for um, thermal plasma, and the aurora borealis is an example for the non-thermal plasma. And it's also the plasma is related to our daily life uh, from the fluorescent light, which is by the excitation of the mercury vapor to give the light. And the utilization of the ozonation system uh, in a swimming pool for disinfection of the water is an example of the plasma application as well. And we have different types of plasma. We often divide it into two categories. Uh, what we call a equilibrium plasma, or also a thermoplasma, which in the thermoplasma, the plasma is activated, created by giving a lot of high energy input, like high temperature input, in which the both the electron in the system is heated up, as well as the remaining gas. So it can go up to very high temperature. The example for that is the sun is a example for a thermoplasma and the lightning strike as well. As for the non-equilibrium, which we often refer to as the non-thermal or cold plasma, for this type of the plasma, only the electron is heated up, while the remaining gas will remain like about uh, ambient temperature, so room temperature. And in this case, the overall temperature of the plasma stay very low and is more applicable for like food applications or production, uh, processing of very heat sensitive materials. And the aurora borealis is an example for that. And as mentioned, like different if we add enough energy, we can create plasma. So there are different types of the plasma sources. Just an overview, very quick. The corona discharge by a pin to plate design is more than used to, in the ozonation system to cr create ozone. And if we get a home ozonation system to clean vegetables or fruits, that is the design they use. And the dielectric barrier discharge system, which we often refer as DBD, in this type of the plasma, uh, they would, we would put a dielectric barrier in between the two electrodes to help us to produce a more uniform plasma. And this is the type of design I use in my lab to process like in-package treatment of food particles. And we also have the plasma jet for more of the localized system. And this is often used um, for medical field. They would use this to treat cancer or skin wound. And we also have microwave, use microwave energy to create plasma, as well as photoplasma, which we use UV light to break down the gas to create the plasma. And the last is a surface DVD design, which oftentimes used in the aeroplanes to kind of modify the flow of air on the wing. So it's what widely used the plasma technology in our daily life. Well, Besides the gas phase plasma, for this specific project, what I want to discuss is we 
create the plasma in a gas form, and those species can solubilize into liquid. Any type of liquid can be activated by the plasma. Those species, uh, once they solubilize into the liquid phase, they can be reacted with the water to create like nitrate, nitride, as well as like a peroxide and peroxy nitride. And all those species, they can be used to like disinfect biofilms or any pathogens on the material. But not only that, it can be used as a, like fertilizer to enhance the growth of the plants. And that is kind of the focus where the, of this study specifically, which we are planning to use the plasma activated water to disinfect like the seeds, alpha alpha seeds that might contaminate it with aspergillus or any other bacteria, but also increase the germination and the growth of alpha alpha seeds. And here is an example of a previous study like by a, collab a collaboration group like which we use the same setup um, of the plasma uh, transformers. Um, here is a kind of a, a setup that they use in this study, which they would treat. So it's a DBD, dietary barrier discharge design. They would put a package, put a petri dish, and 20 ml of water in this design to treat directly under the two electrode field. Uh, they tr in this study, they treated up to 20 minutes, I remember. And what they found that they have noticed an increased germination rate uh, of the seed. So this study, they did uh, soybean seeds it treated in this study. And what they found is a higher germination rate of the untreated soybean seeds after soaking in plasma-activated water. And most importantly, what they found is that they have observed a growth of the seeds in which the untreated seeds soak in water, like showing these two um, red arrows. Um, the treated, uh, the seeds has been kind of watered with the plasma active water has a higher average stem length compared to the one that's been watered with water. And also, what's kind of with expectation, the higher treatment time of the plasma active water has a higher content of peroxide nitrate nitride formation. But we can see here that uh, the, the, the plasma, if we treat the plasma active water too, too long, we might decrease the acidity too much, which also is not ideal for the plant growth. So in my study, we're going to kind of focus on that, monitor the pH and nitrate nitride content in the plasma we Active, uh, active water we generated. And what different from our design is we use, instead of treating like batch to batch 20 ml at a time, in the lab uh, we have designed a more scalable system, which we will create the plasma in a plasma cell, and then we kind of pumping the plasma cell to a microbubble generator and to generate plasma microbubbles. In this case, uh, we have increased treatment capacity. If we have a large enough of vessel, we can treat like 20 liter at the time. Uh, the vessel we have now in my lab, we treat maximum of two liter at a time, but it's still much efficient than treating 20 ml at a time. And so kind of that's a setup, we can see that purple-ish, that is the plasma we generated in the plasma cell. And we, you can see uh, that if we go to the tour after this. We have this design in the lab. And so this is the kind of our plan for this project. Um, is we gonna treat the plasma active water for up to 20 minutes. Uh, the reason we are doing that is we have a previously hub funded uh, project which we treat the plasma active water for 20 minutes and we are able to not kind of have a five log, greater than five log reduction of listeria on the stainless steel plate. So that's kind of, we will start with 10 and 20 from our pre previous study. And we're gonna soak the seeds uh, for up to an hour, and then we're gonna kind of do a microbial analysis uh, at day zero uh, and day one. The reason for that is we want to see any injury after, if we leave the seed longer, if we can see more injury after a day of stor storage. The seed gonna be inoculated with E. coli as a representative of E. coli 0157, and we're gonna also inoculated with Aspergillus ninja as a example for the aflatoxin produced mold. And then besides 
microbial analysis, we're going to do seed germination as well as plant growth analysis to see if we can enhance the growth of alpha alpha. So I think that's all for my study and I'll keep the question in the end. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, moving into our next talk, I'd like to introduce Mohammed Ashur Fuzman and Dr. Ryan Prelly, which you've already heard from today. Uh, Mohammed is an assistant professor in computer science and software engineering here at UW Platteville, and Ryan is an assistant professor in the School of Agriculture. Uh, and for many of you will remember, Ryan is hub funded, as many of our other speakers have been today, but he was one of our first hub funded uh, faculty hired. So. Thank you to them. All righty, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna kick us off. Uh, today we're gonna be presenting our recently funded faculty fellowship that we've been working on collaboratively titled Optimized Usage of Milking Robots. So quick outline, we're gonna talk a little bit about what an automated milking system is, our uh, objectives or questions of the uh, research and then Mohammed is going to take us through the challenge proposal methodology and outcomes we anticipate for this research. So first things first, what is an automated milking system? Often referred to as robotic milking systems or milking robots. I'll probably keep using the word robots or AMS. This is a voluntary system where cows uh, free housed in a pen or a pasture can walk up and get milked when they like. That can be for a variety of reasons, probably the main two being uh, udder pressure and the drive to be milked to relieve that udder pressure, and the other being uh, when a cow goes and gets milk, she gets fed a little bit of feed. It's usually a concentrated feed stuff in a pelleted form, so kind of like a treat. And these cows will visit the AMS multiple times a day, and um, we at uh, UW Platteville have two of these units at Pioneer Farm, which you can see uh, in a farm tour later this afternoon. Uh, and we have one of them pictured to the right. So why is there interest in using these systems on farm? Well, first, there is a shift away from labor for milking individual cows uh, to other aspects of the farm. There are better ergonomics and quality of life uh, aspects for the humans who would be milking cows otherwise. Uh, potentially production benefits, especially for farms that are uh, limited into only two times per day milking versus three or more, that's uh, potential for automated systems. And there's uh, a lot of flexibility to focus on other tasks or to manage your time as a uh, farmer or farm laborer. The big challenge for these systems is they're expensive. They can cost uh, anywhere from like two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars per unit to uh, purchase. But a huge opportunity for these systems is they are a huge data generation tool. And I'm not sure how it shows up there. It might be a little faded. But we have two panels uh, showing the user interface for the Laley Horizon system and the data that it's monitoring. And on the left-hand side, we have a herd level assessment of measurements for cows. And on the right-hand side, we have individual cow measurements. And these uh, robotic milking systems are collecting all kinds of data on the cow. We are collecting characteristics of the milk harvest, how long they're in the box, uh, how long it takes to do different steps of the milking procedure, how much they're yielding. Laley's have inline measurements where we can see things like milk composition, uh, and uh, milk hygiene, looking at somatic cell counts. Uh, and they're often paired with collar systems that look at things like activity and rumination. So there's a wealth of data here that we could potentially leverage to improve our herd level and individual cow management. So uh, for our proposal, we are looking at how we can optimize use of the automated systems while leveraging said data. And with that, we have three, or excuse me, four objectives or questions that we're going to try to address. Uh, how many cows can be milked by one robot? So looking at the expense side of the equation, how can we get the most utility that way? And how much milk a robot can collect per day? So looking at the potential on the revenue end, since milk is revenue on dairy farms. 
Then uh, how can farm op operators organize the cows at pen levels to devise queuing strategies to get a right mix of cows? So looking at features of cows that contribute to AMS efficiency and then developing strategies for right mixing or creating a ideal composition of cows to optimize yield, quality, and AMS usage. Thank you, Ryan. So uh, our um, proposal is that we have a wealth of data that is uh, generated by the, uh, the, by the milking robot. Uh, how can we use that data and how can we uh, apply analytics to the data to find out some real correlationship between uh, the cow behavior and the yield uh, of the milk uh, and and how can I opt we opt optimize the usage of the of the of the robot so the challenges are like three the cow behavior cow anatomy and cow, uh, cow uh, physiology so as Ryan was saying that uh, this is a voluntary system where the cows would come on their own uh, to the uh, milking robot to, to be milk. Uh, and, but at the same time, there is like a, some kind of a competition between the, between the animals, right? Uh, there is also a challenge with the cow at anatomy, particularly the, the, the shape of the udder uh, uh, the, the, the and, the, and the contour of the udder and that, that, that contributes to the how much time the robot takes uh, to get set up to milk a cow. And there is also cow physiology, like uh, different cows uh, milk different, uh, di on different speed. And, and then the uh, milk amount is also different for different cows. So these are the challenges uh, we have when you, we want to consider the data to find out the optimized use of the uh, of the uh, milking robot. So what we are proposing in this project is that we will take the data, uh, we'll apply data, data analytics uh, methodology, uh, methods and, and, and tools, uh, mostly uh, machine learning based uh, data analytics uh, to find correlations between these uh, animal behaviors and uh, the, the, the yield by the by the robot and try to find out uh, the the optimized usage of the of the robot so that as as uh, our previous speaker was saying that you you invest more you earn more but we want to earn even more and at the same time we want to make sure that that the, the animals are not stressed too much uh, to to get the maximum maximize maximize revenue out of them. Uh, so our uh, another uh, as part of the proposal and as part of this process we will will uh, collect the data and we'll curate the data and we'll label the data and our our goal is that not only us but these data sets can be used by other researchers uh, because uh, in, in there's the, in, in data data analytics there's lots of analytics tools there's lots of experts but there is a uh, dearth of uh, availability of data and that too, uh, you know, real life data. So the, if, we, if we can come up with a data set, that would be very helpful to the community. And initially we'll be using data from, from the Lely astronaut um, uh, robot that's, that's are in, the, in, the, in the Pioneer Dairy Farm here. So the methodology, uh, we'll start with uh, uh, collecting the data We'll do the data in, uh, uh, engineering, what is the, like, uh, sanitizing the data, imputing uh, for miss missing data, scaling the data, and, and uh, standardizing the data. And then we'll be doing the data at labeling, like to find out that for, uh, from a manual process that what is the, uh, what, uh, the, the data sets, the in, instance of the different data sets and the labels of the different data sets that in terms of uh, quality of milk and amount of milk and, and so on. 
Then we'll, we'll apply machine learning uh, algorithms. So we still don't know which kind of machine lang uh, learning uh, algorithms we'll be uh, applying, because that will, de that will depend on when we come up with the data sets, we, after we do the labeling of the data sets, then, and, and we find the patterns in the data, data sets, the characteristics of the data set, and then we would, we'd have better understanding that of what kind of machine learning uh, uh, algorithms we are going to apply. So uh, our anticipated uh, outcomes, uh, uh, as we said, uh, a curated labeled data set from the raw data from the uh, milking robots, uh, better insight on relationships between different data items, uh, data-driven guideline for better utilization of the uh, milking robot, and then uh, data-driven guideline for better animal husbandry. Uh, that's what uh, we, we anticipate from, from this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, it's now my pleasure to introduce the last speaker for these research presentations. Caitlin Steffes is a student here at UW Platteville, majoring in agricultural education and a minor in dairy science. In addition to being a student, she is a dairy products technician for Pioneer Sweets. She's going to give us an introduction and update from Pioneer Sweets, the student-run ice cream business. And if we had to pick a favorite speaker, she may rank very high with you because she brought ice cream for us. So we'll get to taste, so pay attention, take notes on what flavor you're going to try. With that, thank you, Caitlin. Hi, everyone. So I'm gonna be talking to you guys about Pioneer Sweets. So for those who did not hear before, I'm Caitlin Steffes. I grew up in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin on my family's dairy farm. So dairy has been a passion of mine since I was very young and being able to work with Pioneer Sweets has been a dream come true as not only do I get to see dairy industry from my farm's point of view, but also from the business side with making ice cream. So who is Pioneer Sweets and what are we? We are a student run ice cream business on UW Platteville on the campus here where we make super premium handcrafted ice cream for our local community and campuses. And we are unique from other ice cream businesses because we are student run. Students make the decisions. We just have Doc Montgomery as our advisor and a focal point and continuous contact. So our story, we were supposed to have our grand opening in 2020. Guess what happened? COVID. So fast forward a year later in 2021, we had our grand opening during our homecoming events that year where we first gave, debuted our products to our campus. From there, Pioneer Suites started because we wanted to do something unique that students would be allowed to, for creativity and learning opportunities. Sorry guys, speaking in front of you guys is a lot different than my 24 students back at Dodgeville. So hands-on learning is a core value here at UW Platteville, and we wanted to bring that opportunity not only to the classroom, but also to get students hands-on learning in the community and working with business partners. Pioneer Suites is here today because of the partnerships with many com community supporters who are interested in supporting our goals and interests. We employ students from all study interests, including agriculture education, agribusiness, and dairy sciences. These students work hard in all aspects of the, of the business, from flavor development to promotion and production. Pioneer Suites is a success because of our hardworking students. As I said, our partnerships are why we're here today, and we're gonna highlight a few of them that we are currently working with or will be working with in the future. So the Mount Horeb Muse uh, Museum is one of the first partnerships that we had. We started this partnership long before Pioneer Suites even existed through our dairy products class when Dr. Montgomery was still running the class. They expressed an interest in having ice cream from UW Platteville in their store. Now they have our ice cream year round in their museum store and have new flavors every summer for their many events. Our next one is the Platteville Mining Museum here in Platteville, obviously. And that partnership started two years ago where they wanna highlight local flavors that can be found in the Driftless Mart area. 
Our newest partnership is with Envision Greater Fond du Lac Agribusiness Council. They wanted to, a way to support college students at their annual breakfast on the farm and use one of their connections, myself, in order to find a way. This last summer, at both of their events where the ice cream was used, sold out. These are our many partnerships which we value. We are currently working with many of these individuals and businesses as well as looking to working with them in the near future. We can't wait to find work with our new partnerships in the future. As I said, hands-on learning is a core value at UW Platteville. Because of that, we didn't want to limit student involvement to those just working with the business. So we created the Ice Cream 101 class. The class gives students who are not already involved in the business to work with Pioneer Suites through flavor development and working with our local partners. It's also a fun class for students to take to get the chance to make ice cream for credit. Who want, want to make ice cream for school credit? This class is open to all students on campus from engineering to agriculture. Our future plans. For those who don't already know, we are in the works on raising money to build our dairy pilot plant and training center at the school farm. Here we will make a wide variety of dairy products, including our own ice cream mix. This will allow us to give more hands-on learning opportunities to our students and make more connections with our community. We've also recently purchased our own popsicle machine that will hopefully arrive before the end of the semester. That way we can make our own popsicles and magnum bars so be on the lookout for Pioneer Suites popsicles. Besides our partnerships, we do a lot of community outreach to the local Platteville community as well as our campus community. One of these opportunities is flavor development. We hold open houses with our Ice Cream 101 class so people in the community as well as on campus get the chance to try our new flavors before they're released. One of these opportunities happened this last, before the fall semester started. Um, students were able, given the opportunity, as well as community members, to try our athletics department flavors, our uh, orange protein ice cream, as well as a Gatorade sorbet. One way we also connect with our on-campus community is through the new student experience. Students, incoming freshmen, transfer or new students, get the chance to work with Dr. Montgomery and do flavor development and they get to learn about Pioneer Suites and what Ice Cream 101 class is all about, all before they even start their first day on campus. The final way we connect with the community, and by far my favorite, is going into the elementary schools and teaching students all about ice cream and the nutritional value of it. And of course, they don't get to leave without having some of our Pioneer Suites ice cream. Thank you. And feel free to follow us on Facebook and Instagram, as well as our email is on the bottom if you're interested in some of our ice cream. Great, thank you so much. All right, questions for the speakers in this blog? Besides what flavors of ice cream did she bring? I'm yeah, just ahead. curious, I'm, I'm curious to know uh, how you got started, a little bit more about how you got started in, in terms of, um, you know, what sort of support, was there, were there any grants or loans or anything like that, or um, supportive opportunities that you, the UWP provided to you or any other institutions? So what I know, limited knowledge, I'll hand this over to Doc in a little bit. One of our bigger sponsors besides the Dairy Innovation Hub was Compure Financial. They gave us a lovely grant in order to get us started, as well as um, we got help building our pilot plant in Glenview Commons. So I'll hand this over to Doc for more of that. Yeah, so um, Caitlin covered it pretty well. Um, we have a, a, an equipment grant um, that the picture that she had up there was our smallest um, machine that we used in there. Um, that was actually a gift from UW-Madison because they didn't need it. So another collaboration. Um, but yeah, uh, Caitlin and I had an opportunity to, to attend the um, ice cream workshop that, that Madison um, puts on as well. So uh, multiple collaborations. But Compier Financial um, and the Dairy Innovation Hub and UW-Platteville have all really been great partners in getting us started, as well as just the interest from our, our local partners. 
Thank one you. Last, one point. last shameless plug. They make an awesome advent calendar, ice cream advent calendar, and I'm told they have like 40 left that are unsold. About 70. So if you want to place your order, talk to these ladies. My question's for the first speaker. Have you looked at plasma activated water as a foliar corn fertilization method at micro rates? Thank you for the question. I'm, I might. It's, the voice is a little bit low, so I didn't hear the. <laughs> corn fertilizer. That part I have not looked at, but I I saw they use it for different type of crops. So they, I think the mechanism is very similar to that. As the the thing they mentioned is the nitrogen nitride in that kind of used as a natural fertilizer in this case. Yes, but we have not looked at corn yet. Other questions for the speakers? All right. Well, we certainly have plenty of time to ask more questions and engage in the posters over lunch. Uh, before I hand this over to Tara to give us instructions on lunch, let's give all of the speakers this morning one more thank you, please. <laughs>